You know, last week we began this sacred pilgrimage, and we talked about, just as your minister Sue is doing on an individual basis, you as a congregation too are taking this spiritual journey. You are going deep within your heart space and finding that place of truth, that source. It is where true transformation occurs. And we ask the question that we often ask and are asked, where are you from? And we played with the words a bit. And instead of noticing that that question may create some context, it may un help us understand that there is a beginning to any journey. When we ask the question, what or who is your from, it begs us to go deeper. We also discussed the thousands of thoughts that you have every day. And those thoughts are absolutely an origination of who and where you are from. We have a thought, we believe it, we feel it, and we have realization or reality made manifest. But doesn't our heritage and lineage go further back behind that thought? Aren't we from something more? I tried my very best last week to channel Abraham. And I said that you were source before you came into this physical body. And the larger part of you is still that source. Still that divine spark that divine inheritance and that source, that godliness of you, that divine love is still offering this vibration, this prayer, this connection. Whether you have realization of it or not, you are somehow still aware of it. It's what brings you back to this building each and every week. And I gave you a homework assignment last week. And I said, I want you to just notice your thoughts. Did you notice them? Did you notice how many times those thoughts might not have felt really great? And did you complete the homework assignment and reach for a higher thought, one that would bring you closer to that connection of source, to bring you into a greater alignment with that source? to take you into a higher consciousness, create a new vision, bring you into a greater realization of who and what you are and who and what you are from. You have awareness of that source, whether you have realization of it or not, because you have emotion. And that emotion is your greatest indicator as to whether or not you are aligned with that connection, that vibration, or you are feeling the discord from it. And I ended my sermon last week by saying that our true source, that which we are from, that which we have come, is our connection with the thought. It is not the thought itself, but our connection with it with that thought, with any thought. So today on our journey from grief to grace, you'll notice the word that is underlined and circled. It's the one you all thought this entire month would be about. What is your definition of grief? Just think about that question for a moment. How do you define grief? Loss. Many of you would say sadness, despair, depression. You know, as grief counselors, we define it as the natural and normal reaction or response to any loss. We think of loss many times as just the loss of physical life through death. But really, we have lots of losses in our life. It's almost any change, really. Something changes and we've lost that comfortable feeling that we just move from. 
So if I could define it for you today so that we are all in the same bus on this journey, it is the natural and normal response to any loss. And we usually talk about there is no right way or wrong way to grieve. Because just as someone over here might have had the definition that it's sadness, someone over here might have said, I'm numb. There's no right way or wrong way. It's just where you are in that moment. And that thought, that feeling, is transitional. Because in the moment that someone over here felt sad, if I ask them in an hour or a day or a week, how do you feel or what are you thinking, it has transitioned to something else. All thoughts and feelings are transitional. You know, we get excited about a lot of journeys in life. We get excited about a summer vacation. We get excited about our journey into college in search of a new goal or career. The journey of a relationship with a significant other. But the journey of grief is a journey that we hope we can avoid. And yet, life continues to say, here it is again. It insists that we take that journey from time to time. And we have all thought to ourselves, heard from others, and even said to others, I wish I was over this by now. Shouldn't I be over this? Shouldn't you be over this? But that word, that term, to get over it, creates this feeling of, how will I ever be able to do that? Why would I want to do that? So what do we do if getting over it, getting over a loss or a change is not a realistic option? We journey through it to get to the other side. We're not going to jump over it. We're going to go through it. You know, as a grief expert, we taught for many years that grief was this linear process, that there were stages or steps of grief. We associate that with a very inspirational author and speaker by the name of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And in her book on death and dying, she listed five stages. You've all heard those. You've talked about them, you've read about them, we've made country songs about them. And those five stages, through anger and depression and bargaining, end up at this place of acceptance. But when we go back and read that book, and if she were still on this planet, you would ask her, because she said it over and over in her latter years, I never said those were the five stages of grief. I said, those are the five stages of receiving catastrophic news. When twin towers fall, that's catastrophic news. And you will certainly be going through many of those emotions. But if you have had a loved one who has been on a journey through their deathing experience that may have been an illness that has been with them for some time, cancer, Alzheimer's, dementia of any kind. It's not catastrophic news when the event happens. And so we no longer teach that grief is this linear step-by-step -step process. Rather, we know that it is an emotional roller coaster ride. It is a whirlwind effect. And just as I mentioned, those thoughts and feelings are transitional all the time. We're going through lots of different thinking patterns, feeling patterns, over and over. And then in our humanness, we like to help each other out of those places. And we say, isn't it time to get over that by now? Isn't it time to move on? We even say things like, let go and let God. 
I ask Joe to sing that very song today. Let go and let God. What does it mean to let go and let God? And these well-meaning people in our lives, you're probably one of them. We've all said something to someone at some point, and we wish we could just suck that back in. It's not that we so much want them to hurry up and get over anything. It's just that in my seeing you in pain, I become uncomfortable. Seeing you in sadness and sorrow, I feel odd and helpless. I don't know what to do or say or how to react, so I'm just going to open my mouth, insert my foot, and say what everyone in my history has ever said. This month we are taking this journey from grief to grace, and with any journey there is certainly a process that begins well before you actually take any journey. Before you get in the car in your driveway, you have to do lots of things. You have to pack your bags. You have to pack your hair products. You have to print out the map. You have to think about where you're going and where you're going to stop, what you're going to eat, where you're going to stay. Lots of things to do before you ever even get in the car. And yet, we don't feel as prepared with the journey of grief because we have come from a history of people who have not been able to speak its language. So we don't know how to pack or how to prepare for it. And so we want to rush our way through it. Grief can be a journey that is filled with, as with any journey in life, tunnels, potholes, and those rest stops. Those tunnels that you go through. I remember being in Chicago, going through that long tunnel, and it was dark and damp and cold. And yet, if I went through it, finally there was light. I got through it. And the potholes on the journey, we want to swerve around and avoid and yet sometimes someone is on either side of us and we just have to plow through. Yesterday I was coming up and I stopped in Joplin and I needed to make a phone call that was probably going to take a little time and being a good guy who was trying to honor my commitment and my contract with Oprah I pulled over and did not talk on my phone in the car. And I pulled over at a rest stop just on the inside of, of Joplin. And I noticed that at that rest stop, there were people who were out of their car, stretching, talking, talking on their cell phones, running their dogs around, playing with their kids. And they were chatting with people they had never met. Strangers. And that really is what the rest stops along any journey are about, is let's take a breather, let's take a break, and on that journey, in that rest stop, there is a common bond. Everyone there is on a journey. That wasn't their final destination. Yet they have this common language. Where are you going? Where are you from? And so they were able to connect. Those rest stops on our journey, on our spiritual journey through grief, is also comprised of those common threads. It's the same language that any griever speaks, and yet it is often a language that is unspoken. It is a language that you can only feel with your heart, a language of the heart, of love, Grief is a route that we want to be avoiding at all times, at all costs. And yet, I want you to imagine with me for just a moment that it could be a route or a process in which you could embrace. 
giving yourself permission to be on that journey, to be where you are in thought and feeling is the first step. Because we talked last week about we have a thought, then we believe it, we feel our way through it, and reality is made manifest. We have a thought. It's not true. But we continue to try to make it true. And we feel not so good. And then our reality continues to be not so good. We suffer in it. If your thought was one that was true, reality would be great. But if your thought is not true, reality is not so great. What's the difference? The difference is that you have temporarily disconnected with the who and what you are from. You have temporarily disconnected from source, from God, from love, from peace, from the knowing, from the trusting that all is well, that there is only one power and one presence, and it is good. Lao Tzu once wrote, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. I believe that that one step, that first step, is permission. Granting yourself permission to grieve, to feel what you're feeling, to do what you're doing, and to change your mind. In granting yourself permission, and let me say that again, in granting yourself permission, I can't grant it for you. You take that first step, whether it is in a place of grieving or just of anxiety or that first step into joy. And unfortunately, many of today's cultural norms don't promote this feeling of health and well-being. It's my belief that our society has become a place where we promote experiential avoidance. The idea that time heals all wounds. Anyone heard that? Anyone believe it? Or the phrase, it must have been God's will. How do you know? Who's God? Or even the term, let go and let God. That it must be in this divine plan. In hearing that as grievers, we tend to push away our thought and our feeling. Put it on a shelf, put it aside, and think, I'll get back to it later. And 20 years later, something happens in our life, someone dies and we're still with this unfinished business. We call that compounded grief because each time it happens, it just compounds onto the next level. That doesn't mean that those people who are saying those phrases, we've all been one of those people. Those uses of insignificant platitudes, if you will, are trying to hurt you. It's just that they were never taught what to say instead. It means that they, like us, don't know how to deal with where you are in the moment. You know, there's only one way to stop grieving, and that is to stop loving. Anyone here want to do that? And... You know, it's just never going to happen, is it? It's that greater part of us, of source, that is divine love, that is always loving. And we have those feelings of sadness or despair or anxiety or fear or loneliness or whatever it is that you may be feeling. Sometimes even a feeling of embarrassment or guilt I had the great pleasure yesterday of spending many hours with your minister, Sue. 
who again is going through her own journey of grief. And she shared with me that her latest feeling was one of numbness. She just feels numb. Anyone ever been there? I've been behind lots of people at red lights who must be numb because they just don't go anywhere. And that's really what that feeling of numbness is. It's different than denial. Hear that again. Numbness is different than denial. This is a feeling as though you've just been removed from all of your emotions completely for a moment or two or five or a day. Many times we experience the struggle of our urges to simply fade away, to hide. And I can speak from personal experience that we as men are really good at that. We like to disconnect a bit because we have been taught, whether it was our thought or someone else's, by a phrase that might have said, you are the strong one. You're a man. Buck up. And yet I ask the question, where did that come from? What source did that come from? we've evolved to this place where we as men are not as comfortable with our feelings or with sharing our emotions. We're certainly not as comfortable as our counterpart, who I believe are the stronger of our species, by the way. I'll get many hugs after service for saying that. And, you know, I recall as a child sitting in vacation Bible school, learning the shortest verse in the Bible because it was the easiest one to memorize. Do you remember the verse? Jesus wept. And it was not until my own journey through grief that I actually went back and read that story in its entirety. Though that verse is neat, cute, easy to memorize, powerful in its own statement, it is the story in its completed state that gives us the greatest example of permission. Jesus was standing at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. Some translations say his brother, or as translated, his cousin. Standing there, weeping. But it is the next verse after that that says, and the Jewish people who were behind him, his friends, his family, said, look how he must have loved him. Look how he must have loved him. And as I studied that piece of scripture, I studied it in 18 different translations of the Bible, and every one of them had an exclamation point behind the term, look how he must have loved him. For tears such as those streaming down his face, it must have been love. It is a power and a presence and a feeling and an emotion that can be good. Because the byproduct of grief is love. And giving yourself permission to grieve, to feel what you're feeling, it takes courage, doesn't it? It takes a commitment. It takes a trust. A trust in yourself that you can get through it. A trust in your source that you have support. A trust in the mystery. I said in the meditation that life is not this problem to be solved. It is a mystery in which we can live. Amy, thank you for coming and singing that song with Joe. I release and I let go. I let go and I let God. What does that mean? Though? What does it mean to let go of something? You know, we often think, I love 
this thing or this person. And if I let go of them, I will feel what? Empty? Confused? In despair? And so you will have to come pry it out of my hands because I am in control of how and how long I'm going to hold on to them. And when we finally do get to that place of letting go, whether it is from our own understanding or because we have been forced to let go, we do feel empty. We feel abandoned. Feel in despair. This morning, let me teach you another way to let go. Because that control that you feel, and though we all know in truth that control is the illusion, we think I will let go in time, one finger at a time. But if I let go, I will feel abandoned. I will feel alone. I want you to just notice something. That was one way, one thought, one belief of letting go. And you lived into it, and you felt it. And the reality manifested of a not-so-good feeling. Or you could learn to let go. in a different way. And this person, place, or thing is still a part of you, still with you. Our scripture today is from 2 Corinthians, and it says, Fix your eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is is eternal. And when we let go, whether it is this easier way or this harder way, where is our focus? What have we fixed our eyes and thoughts on? The absence of. Our thoughts and our eyes and our heart is focused on that person, place, or thing that we have let go of. And we are doing exactly what Scripture says don't do. Don't fix your eyes on what is seen. Fix your eyes on what is unseen. What is unseen is everything around this thing that is seen. It is love. It is peace. It is joy. It is hope. And whether this person, place, or thing moves on or shaken from my hand or blown by the wind, all of those things remain. I counsel people all of the time in their deepest moment of despair, and I hear this resounding theme, this reoccurring theme that I have lost them and a part of me. I get that. It's as if our identity has been stolen. We don't know who we will be without them. And we even voice that, who will I be without them? The truth is, if you really go deep, you're not missing them. Let this sink in. You're not missing them because if you let go one way, they've never left. They're not somewhere else in which you can miss them. You're missing the feeling of connection to them. You're missing the feeling of connection to you. You're missing the feeling of connection to the greater part of you that is the source of you. You're from love, God, peace, joy, whatever name you want to give it. And it is the separation of you from that source in that moment. As with Sue and as with you, there is a journey happening at any given moment of our day. We 
is a journey through grief, through grace, through love, through joy, through anxiety, through worry, through fear, back to joy. It's not this step-by-step process. It is this roller coaster ride called life. And if we would give ourselves permission to feel what we're feeling, we would find that that feeling is transitional. But if we never allow ourselves to go there, if we hold it at bay, it can't transition. It can't transform. We can't transform. We can't move through it. You may have feelings of sadness or numbness, of despair. Whatever the case may be, don't underestimate the value of what you're feeling. There was a little band out of Liverpool. Some of you are old enough to remember them. Another generation just thinks we named a car after them. The Beatles made this song really great, Let It Be. I know it's early, so I won't make you sing it. Let it be, let it be, whisper words of wisdom, let it be, let it be, let it be, and there will come an answer. There will come an answer, but not if you're holding it at bay, not if you're putting up this floodgate, not if you've built this wall. I wish we would start singing, let go and let it be. Let it be and let God. Let it be and let me be. Let it be and let them be. Let life be all that it is. Time by itself heals nothing. Do we agree? But time plus love fosters this route to healing. And by that I mean it's a lifelong process. There's no shortcut. There's lots of detours, but there's no shortcut. And it is in our common joys and our common sorrows that we are able to stop at those rest stops along the way and be in communion one with another and find our connection once again with source with love, with God. This empty feeling that we call grief is simply our disconnection from that. We used to say that grief takes years. I said that a hundred times. It will take you weeks, months, or years to get over this, to get through it, to get around it, whichever route you decide to take. And I realized That was one thought, and I believed it. I said it, I felt it, I tried to get you on that journey so that your reality would be in alignment with mine. Here is another thought. It's one that is as true or truer as that, and that is that when you come into the alignment of that which is true with a capital T, you will find that that grief place is simply your disconnection with the moment of truth with your source, with love. This is one life, one mind, one power, one presence. It is God. It is good. And it is my belief, as we state each and every week, that wherever we are, God is all is well. And that love, that God, that understanding, that wisdom is the center of everywhere who has a circumference of nowhere. All consuming, omnipotent. Wherever you have been, wherever you are, wherever you seem to be going, remember that you live each and every moment on a journey that if you would grant yourself permission to feel what you're feeling and let it transition and pass, 
if you grant yourself permission to have a feeling that may be one of sadness or numbness or despair and reach for a thought and a feeling that feels better. You allow for the poise to surrender. To surrender completely to the next evolution of your growth and of your transformation. And the journey to or toward that. We will join again next.